Parental discretion is advised for the following program. The Now and Then Show with your host, Odd Bob Avery, is made possible by grants from the following businesses. King of Hearts, Goldsmith, maker of fine handcrafted jewelry. Menage a Trois, custom videography, photography, and design here on the North Coast. Southern Exposure, a full service salon where everyone goes to look good. PM's Cafe, late night eats for late night people. John Chamberlain, signs, murals, advertising, now located at Casper Inn in beautiful downtown Casper. And the Casper Inn, the finest liquors and live entertainment in Mendocino County. Coming to you from that picturesque coastal village where vegetation has always grown wild and helicopters never used to hover overhead. Where camper and grower alike look forward to these three words live from Mendocino. It's the Now and Then Show. Starring that omnibus of talent, the oddest of all Bobs, Odd Bob Avery. This is Meg Harris inviting you to stay tuned for the next 60 minutes and enjoy Bob's guests. Cash crop author Ray Raphael. Sensimia Tips, publisher Tom Alexander, and local Frank Creasy, along with our special musical guest, Charlie Reamer. And now, here he is, a man so concerned with the balance of nature that he doesn't get up in the morning until the night shift goes to bed, Odd Bob Avery. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi guys. Hi Bob. Much improved now and then band every time. It gets better. It's great. Welcome to our little garden. We've had a great show for you tonight. We have some very special guests. Ray Raphael, who is the author of The Cash Crop, which is a uh, up-and-coming bestseller. We have uh, Frank Creasy here, who is a locally outspoken advocate of law and order, who is going to uh, take the advocacy position for us tonight. We also have Tom Alexander, who is the publisher of Sensimilia Tips. And we have some segments of Man on the Street tonight, and we also have a uh, clip of film that was taken this afternoon with uh, Mr. Rusamenti of the Camp Forces. So all together, I think we're going to have an interesting and provocative evening for you. And without further ado, we're going to take a little break right now for our first Man on the Street segment, and we will be right back. So welcome and thank you. Hi, this is Meg Harris. I'm down here in Mendocino. We're going to be asking some people on the streets questions here about how they feel about marijuana and camp, otherwise known as campaign against marijuana production. And let's see if we can get our first person here. How do you feel about camp? I think that the government is invading people's privacy and uh, I personally am not growing any marijuana but I don't like the idea of people uh, flying over my property and uh, uh, looking around for anything. So I think it's, it's really an illegal process and it ought to be challenged. I don't agree with the, uh, with the methods. They're a little bit too heavy handed I think for, for, the, uh, for what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, but it's pretty typical of, of uh, the governor of California and the uh, former governor of California, our president, and their sort of military approach to everything. Not too far from where we live. Uh, in the last month, one grower was killed by a sheriff's deputy and a camp agent. Oh. So, so we're not too wild about the methods that they're using. It's a little too militaristic. I think they ought to just make it legal to grow it, and then they can get some tax money off those farms that are growing it. I think it sucks in relation to, I think there's a way more important things that can be done with uh, that sort of money and, uh, and force. They go about it wrong. Watch this hidden camera demonstration. Unknowing to Bud, we have slipped some huge grow Bud food into his drink. Drink up, Bud. That a boy. A few moments later, Bud has suddenly grown 
200 pounds heavier. And just look at him sweat. So if you want bigger, juicier buds, buy huge grow bud food. You won't believe what it'll do to your bud. Brought to you by the makers of Huge Grow Bud Food. Sold at stores everywhere. All right, we're back. That was great. Thanks, guys. How are you tonight? Just fine. Good. You've done all your homework, I hope. I did all my homework. I read everything I was supposed to. What a woman. Me too. <laughs> this should be real interesting tonight. I'm really I'm looking, looking forward, forward to this. To I, uh, I hope our guests are too, because it should be an exciting, interesting evening. At this point in the show, though, we're going to uh, deal with the remnants of last week's show and uh, read the letters. <laughs> we always like to read the letters for some obscure reason. <laughs> But uh, we'll kick right off with this one. Dear Odd Bob, I like the direction the show is taking and it's growing improvements. No gradual improvements, that is, anyway, of growing on the minds. Of the <laughs> I really enjoy the idea of the themes for each show. So how about shows about the offshore oil development? Good idea. Or okay. village development? Or maybe the uh, insider's view of local street people? But I especially like the theme of the changing Mendocino, how it was then and the way it is now. The changing values of the locals, the gravitational pull, dragging Mendocino towards total tourist sellout. Well, now that's kind of not a really objective, but uh, we could take up a show like that. A village where no one lives, just works. I could go on forever. <laughs> Truly yours, Nancy McCollum Evans. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Dear Bob, I like the addition of more band members, and especially a live drum set. All right, it adds a real spontaneity to the show. But I would like to ask if the band could be featured more often as they sound so tight. How about that, guys? Right. Perhaps a uh, complete song now and then. <laughs> and maybe how about adding a horn player? Well, we got that covered. Just a suggestion. That comes from Doc in Los Angeles. Los Angeles, huh? Yep. That's a stopping ground of yours or, or Doc? No, no stopping ground of mine, Bob. This next letter is actually uh, more for you than anyone else, Meg. It's uh, really? Dear Odd Bob. I saw your last show where you introduced your new co-host, Meg Harris, and where you also tried getting the, quote, dirt from your guest, Connie Dream. Well, I ha have some dirt on Meg I would like to share with you. What? Oh. Oh. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute, Bob. All right, all right. Meg stated she has received a very expensive pearl necklace from a, an admirer, but then had given the necklace back when she realized the admirer wasn't her type. That's true. You did say that, didn't you? Um... I don't think I should say anything at this point, Bob. All right, well, let me continue. <laughs> well, I know for certain she never returned the pearls and still has them to this day. Now, what do you think about that? Thanks for letting me get that off my chest. Signed, not her type, Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> well, what, do you, what do you have to say about that? You, you, you kept the pearls, huh? I... You never thought you'd get busted, did you? I don't think I can say anything at this time about this, Bob. I would suggest I you get a hold of my lawyer. Uh, you know? Well, if it's necessary, and we, we haven't heard from any attorneys yet, and let's hope we don't, I might remind I you... I did uh, return them, okay? You might not have gotten it, but I did return them. <laughs> Take that, Detroit. That's what we think about that. I want to remind you, uh, viewers, too, that you can write to us here at the Now and Then Show, and we'll show you an address later, so if you feel like you want to, we'd like to hear from you. We're going to take a little break, and then we'll be right back with our first guest. So, uh, thank you. We'll be right back. I lived here a year ago. A year ago, and yeah. now where do you live? Uh, I live in San Anselmo. Oh, that's beautiful there. Uh, yeah, it's in lovely Marin County. 
No, we don't. No. And where do you? Where are you from? We're from Orland. No. I live in uh, Woodland, California. Woodland, California. Have you been to Mendocino before, or are you just passing through? No, I've been up in this country. I got a fishing partner up here. We fish a lot. Oh, great! It's beautiful up here. No, <laughs> I don't uh, live just here. Just visiting. <laughs> yeah. What do you like most about Mendocino? Uh, well, it's very pretty. It is. It's very pretty. I sure do. <laughs> what do you like most about Mendocino? Uh, not having to deal with Cam. Uh, people are pretty nice. We don't need camp, we don't need that kind of uh, push. You know? I think they're really out of sync with, with life. Yes, I do. I just moved up. You just moved up? Yeah. What do you reason. like the best about men? What do you like the most about Mendocino? Uh, the charisma, the feeling about it, the charisma. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> uh, how long have you lived here? Uh, since 1976. What do you like the most about the area? The environment. I do. How long have you lived here? Oh, just two years. Oh, what do you like the best about the Mendocino area? Oh, I like uh, the people and the climate and uh, just the village quality of it. And uh, it's pretty exciting living here, but yet it can be very mellow and uh, very nice. You can really tune into nature. So you have the best of both worlds, I think. What the? Oh, you must be the guys for the interview. Uh, come with me. I'll show you the good one. Stop for that truck. Ah! Jesus. Yeah, what do you think of that duty, huh? That's one of my best purple buds. <laughs> yeah, well, what the heck kind of uh, fertilizer do you use? Fertilizer? I use huge grow bud food. It causes some strange mutations in the plant. Uh, Look at the size of these leaves. Yeah, that's the, isn't that wonderful? That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, these are some uh, extraordinary specimens. But isn't it a little difficult to uh, work like this out here in the woods? Is it safe? Yeah, it's the safest place you could possibly be. Hey, where the heck did he go? Okay, here we are. We're back again. Thanks, guys. A little beast of uh, Steppenwolf there for us out of the history of uh, the world. <laughs> At this point, I'd like to uh, take great pleasure in introducing our first guest of the evening. This is Ray Raphael, who is the author of the book Cash Crop, which I have right here. And uh, this was written uh, as an objective historical look at the uh, marijuana growing situation in California and elsewhere. We have some questions for Ray, so I'll bring him out right now, Ray. How are you tonight? Just fine. You've had a busy day, I understand. Yeah, I have been busy all day. Good. Well, I hope we won't wear you out tonight. If you aren't worn out after today's experience, then you'll probably be just fine. Right? Uh, I read somewhere that a fellow named Steve Chappell had written a book called uh, Outlaws in Babylon, which infuriated you so much that you decided you had to undertake the research for your book, Cash Crop, from a, a more objective perspective. Is that true? Yeah, uh, the book Outlaws of Babylon was really just the last straw. There's been a history of the, over the last 10 years of, of uh, exploitation of the marijuana theme in the national press. And what's come down is that this particular area, Mendocino and Humboldt counties, and I live right on the border between the two, have become a sort of debauched red light district for the whole country to get their thrills off of. While well, somewhere out there, there are these wild and woolly growers growing the weed, and uh, they live a lifestyle where they shoot each other and so on, and there's booby traps in the hills, and they're making millions of dollars, and have made great copy for the magazines and so on. And then um, 
people would ask me periodically, well, since I'm a writer, I've written several other books on the area, why don't you write up about this issue? But um, I had the perception, well, hey, there's so much uh, exploitation, I don't want to be a part of that, I don't want to exploit this issue. But then there came a, uh, came a book, Outlaws of Babylon, which purported to be a, quote, true life documentary of this situation. And it was just more of the same. And I said, hey, this is it. And a lot of people around the community said, why don't you write something just locally based, where you talk to the people and they say what's really coming down, so I did it. Well, unlike Chapel, I guess uh, you are familiar with a lot of the people in the area because you've lived here for some time, and this apparently made it easier for you to, uh, to get accurate interviews. Is that yeah, true? I had access to information, really, just being a longtime resident of the area, that, uh, that people coming in from the outside, like Chapel or, or other reporters just didn't have. I've been a local resident. I've, I know many people who are in, in the grower community, many people who are in town and business community just all around. I'm a teacher. I know a lot of kids, a lot of parents, everything. So uh, when it came time to say, okay, well, how, who would you interview to really give a full representation of the different lifestyles in, in this area, uh, I just knew folks to interview. I knew uh, many of the old timers from my earlier work with history and uh, a lot of the young pioneers who came, some of whom uh, raised marijuana and some of whom don't. And so I went and talked to them and everybody, curiously enough, was very willing and anxious to be a part of this project. In a sense, I had very little to do with it. I organized it and compiled it and tied it together, but it's really a collective portrait, a collective self-portrait of a community which has been uh, uh, exploited in other people's minds and didn't like it anymore. Mm -hmm. The town people didn't like it, the Chamber of Commerce fellow didn't like it, uh, nobody really liked it, certainly the growers didn't like it, and uh, in a sense I feel even the law enforcement people didn't like it. Well, because it wasn't accurate, really. Yeah, and also because the, it, it added to their problems, and they know that. They're, you know, they know that uh, this kind of uh, extensive and outrageous publicity uh, just draws more attention to the area and draws more, uh, particularly when the publicity was on the order of all the extra money that was being made, and you can made a mil make a million dollars if only you come to Mendocino or Humboldt County, mm -hmm. and a lot of people come in and they uh, and you do get, you know, an element of violence and greed and so on into the community that wasn't uh, that prevalent before, and it makes people's jobs harder. So a lot of the law enforcement people too thought, hey, yeah, it's time for a, a, an accurate assessment of what this, uh, how the how the industry started and how it evolved and how it's really affecting our community from all the different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Well, from what I can see, 80% of the book is oral interview and 20% is sort of a narrative that you've constructed to tie it all together. Uh, there's no apparent attitude on your part coming out of your narrative in there in terms of being pro or against marijuana growing or, or whatever's going to happen with it. But I wonder, after all of your research, if you came to any conclusions from an historical or personal perspective about what might happen in the future. We'd all be curious about that. I think that the, the main conclusion I came to through the process of writing the book is that Nobody in the community is particularly happy with a situation where history seems to have run away with itself, where nobody's in control, where the, uh, uh, where the, um, the exaggeration of the industry got so big in the public mind that, that uh, people came in specifically to make a, a lot of money, they brought uh, greed and violence with them, it was exploited by the press, then that brought it in camp and the law enforcement, and uh, basically it got to a situation that nobody wanted. The growers didn't want it that big, the original growers who started with a few plants in their backyard. The townspeople didn't want it. You know, the, who are these people changing our local rural lifestyle from nowhere? Uh, the Chamber of Commerce didn't want it. Uh, the new image of uh, Mendocino and Humboldt County isn't the nice peaceful place. It's this, you know, war-torn land. They don't want that. The policemen don't want all this extra uh, job that's creating big headaches. Nobody wants it, so why do we have it? And, and really, so that's my interest as a longtime local resident is that every, despite all the diversity that we have in this community, uh, the different views about drugs and marijuana and so on, everybody is together on that point that they would like to have some sense of a, a return of kind of local, local control of our destiny, somehow come to grips with what's really coming down. Well, the camp uh, people and the, uh, certainly the people that believe in law and order are convinced that they can proceed to eradicate the problem by their method, and we're going to explore that shortly. But it will be interesting to find out if they really feel that that's, that's possible. I would like to ask you if you think that's possible. I, certainly, total eradication is not possible. I mean, how can you eradicate something that, uh, uh, on the supply side that everybody 
uh, that tens of millions of people in the country like to use. You just can't do it. It's going to come in on boats. It's going to be grown in people's closets. It can be grown, you know, if you have a closet, you can put a few lights in and grow it in your closet, uh, in, in your backyard, wherever. Uh, you're not going to eradicate the entire, the entire crop. You can certainly make it uh, hard to grow, difficult to grow. You can make it difficult to grow in large quantities and get away with it. So, in other words, eradication can certainly have an impact and it has had an impact. Certainly uh, in uh, this, these last few years, eradication has had some impact on the supply. I'm sure it has. I've, I've heard that on the grapevine, so to speak. And uh, we'll explore that very shortly, too. Right now we're going to take a little break, and then we'll be... We'll, 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 <laughs> we'll be back with our next guest, Charlie Reamer. Do you think marijuana should be legalized? Uh, I think under certain circumstances it should, certainly. Uh, but it should be controlled just like alcohol is. No. I think I I think the current legislation is good enough. I think it's I don't think it's something that should be bought in stores. But I don't think that um, the current approach is they're using to eradicate the crop is not the right way to do it. Uh, in my mind, I think it already is legalized. <laughs> All right. I, I don't think that it's any a serious threat anymore like it was to be caught with an ounce about five years ago. You were in big trouble. Now it's a fine. I think. Or, Ah, uh, well, I suppose maybe the easier. <laughs> yeah, I think so, absolutely, because I think it would qualify the uh, use of it and, uh, you know, uh, get rid of this, uh, the crap that's going on right now, you know. I don't think it's an illegal drug. It grows on the earth. Well, I think that there should be some kind of a um, symposium or some kind of a vote or discussion of, of uh, how it would be if it were legal and just try to understand what it would be like for it to be legal and also um, what it's like for it to be illegal because mm -hmm. either way there would still be a lot of trouble. So. I, don't, I don't know about the issue of uh, legalization because uh, uh, I think that would bring all kinds of other regulation and so forth. Um, in, in, a, in a sense, I think it's a, a, a victimless situation. You know, I think uh, sugar and alcohol, all kinds of things are bad for you, but um, I don't know if you can leave it up to the state to regulate it. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. Come here, big boy. After many day, riding reservation, fixing fence, I reach for heavy extra. Good fire water, good beer. Can't drink on TV. Heavy beer. Good fire water for very little wampum. Buy a heavy, buy a heavy, buy a heavy, heavy beer, buy a heavy. Right now on the show, I'd like to introduce a man that a lot of you need no introduction to, however some of you do, so I will tell you that he is a star of stage, screen, television, radio, newspapers, magazines, bathroom walls, and he is a master blues performer. He's going to do his version right now of a love song for you, Mr. Charlie Reamer. Mary Jane, why did you leave me? Where did you go when the summer came? I miss you so. You know that it grieves me. I haven't been high in such a long, long time. It didn't rain this morning, and it didn't rain all week. Hasn't rained in such a long, long time. I 
know we're gonna have a dry street. Oh, Mary Jane, why did you leave me? Where did you go in the summer came? I miss you so. You know that it grieves me. I haven't been high in such a long, long time. Well, I know that I got a woman And she's always on my side She comforts me when I need her She takes me for a ride When I think about her And I remember what was good I know I could live without her But I don't believe a word Oh Mary Jane Why did you leave me? Where did you go when the summer came? I miss you so know that it grieves me I haven't been high in such a long, long time No, I, I haven't been high in such a long, long time right. Mr. Charlie Reamer, ladies and gentlemen We'll be right back with Frank Greasy, Tom Alexander, Ray Raphael and much more for you, so stay with us nervous when you hear low-flying helicopters over your house? Stand wide. I would Certain get very people nervous would. if I heard low-flying helicopters over my house in San Anselmo, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I used to when I was in Vietnam, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd probably get nervous. If, uh, especially if I had a real good crop out there, I guess I would have. A million dollar uh, farm going. <laughs> Not so far this year. <laughs> well, I don't really hear them, but I think uh, helicopters have got about the, be the, about the most obnoxious machine ever created, and uh, uh, they also remind me of uh, uh, warfare in Vietnam and so forth. So, uh. You know, nutrition is an important part of every puppy dog's life. Vitamins and minerals that uh, make your dog grow. If you're afraid your dog isn't growing fast enough, you should try a little bit of heavy grow bud food. You just take a little and pour it into their water every day, like Oh, little dog this much, bigger dog about this much. And you call him over. Come here, bud. Come on over here, bud. Good dog. Good dog. Have some of that. You'll agree with me that heavy grow bud food does the job. back with Meg and Ray and at this point in the show I'd like to introduce our second guest for the evening actually our third Charlie being the second this is mr. Frank Creasy who is a uh, local resident has been here for a few years is a retired farmer and is an advocate of law and order uh, Bill Russomendi was originally scheduled to be on the show but he could not be here and at the last moment Frank very kindly agreed to come and uh, represent his stand for us so right now I'd like to introduce you all to Frank Creasy Frank Thank you. 
appreciate you being able to come down and be with us tonight, Frank. Well, it's my pleasure. I appreciate your inviting me. Not at all. We're interested in providing everyone with as much information as we can about what appears to be a very large uh, problem for a lot of people in the county. You have uh, been an advocate of law and order and uh, very outspoken in several areas about that. And I'd like to uh, ask you, as an advocate of law and order, do you see any potential for the continued uh, persecution of marijuana growers? Do you think that it will lead to eradication? Do you think that's possible? Well, to start off with, I'd like to say how much I appreciate your background. But you're in the mood to talk about the law. <laughs> but I would object to the word persecution there. Could we perhaps choose a different word? Prosecution. Prosecution. I'll accept that. Okay, you've announced me as a law and order person, and I am. And I think my first and basic objection to growing a pot is it's illegal. And it's been determined by the people twice in a public vote that the majority of the people do not want it legalized, and they want it the um, growing of it suppressed. Now we're a, we're a nation of laws and in a democratic society the will of the majority prevails. And on that basis even a bad law must be obeyed until it can be changed. Now I have an, an, on a number of times, a number of instances, worked to change a law that I thought was not correct for some reason or other. But until it was corrected, I lived by it. <laughs> now, thank you. Now, while we, uh, we could argue the, the philosophy of whether pots should be grown or shouldn't be grown, and we can uh, go off into all sorts of tangents on this subject, because as you said, it's a very complex subject. But the basic fact is, it's against the law, it's a felony, and people that do it uh, have placed themselves outside and above the law. Now, as a parent, I would hate to leave my son or my children the legacy of being uh, the son or daughter of a convicted felon. That would bother me. And this is what <clears throat> the people are risking when they do it. Now, the, uh, there's, a, there's a dozen different reasons, more than that, why I think it's wrong, but basically, uh, you've got to come to grips with that. Now, Gallup issued a poll, which they do at frequent intervals, and it showed that in 1984, 73% of the people do not uh, approve of pot. They want it suppressed. 23% would like to see it legalized. Uh, I don't know where the pot growers stand. Maybe some of them are making so much money they just soon not see it legalized. Well, from what I understand, the attitude coming from the pro-marijuana forces is almost 180 degrees the opposite of that in terms of their consensus polls and the, the uh, feeling they get from people. They feel that the majority now favor the legalization of marijuana, so I'm sure, like the Bible and anything else, you can find statistics to underwrite your feeling uh, without having the actual material here to, to back us up. It's, it's hard to go on with that, but let me ask you a question. If, uh, if it were to come to a vote again and it was decided uh, that the people in, let's say, the state of California decided to legalize marijuana and the growing of marijuana, uh, how would you feel about that? Would you then respect that decision and, and go along with it, or would you still have a, an ingrown feeling that it would be wrong? Well, if it came to a vote, um, I would oppose it as strongly as I could. If it passed, then I would accept the will of the majority. I, as I said before, uh, I would consider it a mistake, but I would accept it. So. Um, I could not really um, hold the view that I do about law and order and say, as the growers are saying now, we don't like this law and therefore we're not going to live by it. I couldn't accept that. I don't accept it from them and I, and I would not adopt that attitude myself.
we feel like there's something of a dual standard in uh, people building chain link fences and using guard dogs to defend their constitutional, constitutional property rights to grow an illegal product. It's sort of a dichotomy of the feeling there. Is that what you think? Well, um, I don't know. Do they have a constitutional right to grow pot? Well, that's not really what I was saying. I was saying that they are using sometimes the, the law of private property and the right to do what you will with your own property to defend their growth of marijuana. It gets well, really complicated when you think of having to usurp one right to abrogate another. Well, the uh, use of property has been regulated. That goes a long way back. We regulate it with zoning laws and building laws and all sorts of laws. Um, and in, in the final analysis, as I said before, in a democratic society, we accept the right of our uh, lawmakers to to impose certain conditions on us, certain guidelines. Now, it's my feeling that if if you think a law is wrong, you should work to get it changed. Uh, I recall the first time that um, pot came up for a, a vote, and I was asked to sign the petition to get it on the ballot, and I did because I thought that it needed to be submitted to the people and get a a feeling for what the people thought about it. So I signed it at the same time telling the petition circulator that I was going to work against it and would vote against it. Uh, I don't have any problem with um, with that. Uh, if, they, if anybody circulates a petition again and it appears to have any chance of getting on the ballot, I'll sign it again. Because uh, if, your, if your feeling is correct or if the grower's feeling is correct that there would be a change in attitude in the state of California and that the majority of the people would would um, determine that pot should be legalized. Um, that's the way it is. Then you would go with the will of the people. Certainly, absolutely. Let me take this opportunity <laughs> to introduce our next guest, who uh, has a very much vested interest in the uh, in the future of marijuana growing. He is the publisher of Cincinnati Tips, which is a magazine directed to the uh, growth and propagation of, of marijuana. Mr. Tom Alexander, Tom. Well, thanks for coming, Tom. Appreciate it. This is your magazine, something you've been publishing now for what five years. This okay. is the uh, the glorious fifth anniversary issue with a full color cover, and it's quite obvious that from uh, what two years ago this was '83 that uh, the magazine has grown right along with the marijuana industry, from uh, from a homegrown to a rather glossy magazine. Uh, I read in here something that may have a direct impact on your future in the publishing business. You have said that there is a movement now to uh, to make this magazine and many other things related to the marijuana industry paraphernalia and as paraphernalia it would become illegal just like the, the plant itself is. How is that progressing? Does that look well, like a reality? Last uh, 1984 at the Douglas County Fair in Southern Oregon a woman was arrested for possessing my magazine as drug paraphernalia. Subsequently, charges were dropped, and the county offered her $3,000. She refused, and now she's suing him for $125,000. I went to the Oregon legislature three times and testified in subcommittee hearings about this drug paraphernalia bill, which was proposed, and they, they killed it, dropped it, because their legal counsel said it was unconstitutional and that they would be facing a lawsuit by me to them. But it just underscores the outrageous contempt for civil liberties that, that the government and the people that are for uh, any type of prohibition of marijuana, they, uh, they feel that it's worth our country's constitution to go after marijuana growers. That includes flying helicopters over people who aren't growing marijuana, but they aerial survey the whole, whole country. Uh, that includes trying to wipe out my magazine. These are basic tenets of our government, and uh, the opposition, who is our government, is trying to uh, destroy them. Do you think that a lot of that is the result of this, the simple size of the operation, the fact that uh, marijuana is grown in such large pl uh, plots, and uh, that there are magazines like this, which are obviously uh, uh, involved with that industry, that just, it seems like an affront 
to people who believe that something illegal should not be that blatant. Is that part of the problem? Do you think if it was reduced to a homegrown situation where people grew one or two plants, that that would go away? It certainly wouldn't no, help I, you. Would it? Uh, well, it would because there's uh, personal use growers are interested in my magazine. People who don't even grow marijuana read my magazine just for the informational to know what's going on, get a feel of the industry. But uh, it's, it's a huge industry. It's an industry that has moved indoors to the point now that Mendocino Humboldt are really uh, not the substantial suppliers anymore. San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, Los Angeles, the major cities are the suppliers with warehouses, basements, uh, attics. Uh, basically, the city police don't have the time to look into marijuana, and the cities are becoming huge cultivation areas. Indoors. Indoors, with, with lights Eli that are, lights uh, and you know, like this studio, thousand watt lights that produce a quality product that many people cannot tell the difference. Well, I read, I think, in your magazine of one operation that had been busted because they could they measured the utility bill and found well, that it was some $10,000 a month or something like that, well, and it was unusual, but that was thrown out, wasn't it? Well, we've had five cases in the state of Washington and three cases in Oregon where the rare instances that the grower fights the government in court have been found to be unconstitutional and the evidence thrown out because, as the judge state, it doesn't definitively show that there's probable cause to, to get a search warrant for marijuana. It just shows that there's high electric use. And so all the tactics that the government tries to use and endure are going to be much ho harder to uphold in court. Well, you must agree with Ray then that there's no possibility in the world of eradicating well, marijuana growing. Do you? Uh, I feel that the government is not losing the war, they've lost it. And it's time not to, to uh, argue the merits of legalization, it's time to question when it's going to happen and then, and then discuss, are the growers going to control the industry or is the government going to hand it over to the corporations? And that's going to be the, the real fight. I think legalization is a bygone conclusion. It's just a question of when. I personally feel our government's going bankrupt. And the financial aspect of the situation, they're going to have to accept it. And the way they're going to sell it upon people such as the guest next to me is, you're going to be saving our country from financial ruin. And they'll be doing a patriotic thing by accepting it. Well, in either case, <laughs> In either case, you've mentioned uh, large types of operations, whether the growers control it or the government controls it. What happens to the individual in that instance? Do, uh, do the individuals, are they wiped out well, of the picture because of industry or no, what? No, I mean, the basic foundation of, of the distribution network is formed. There's small networks uh, all, all over the country that I've traveled and visited that do the distribution process. and and. I, I envision that that is going to be uh, put together and it will compete against the corporations. It's just we have to fight the government so that they don't put uh, undue restraints on individuals and co-ops that do market against the corporations. I'd like to open this up now so that all of you can participate in the conversation. I would like to ask one question to do that. Uh, Ray, you and uh, Tom here were uh, privy to be at a forum on the coast recently, which was a secret forum, more or less. It was not open to the public, and as far as we know, it was to discuss some of the aspects of marijuana. I don't know if we're allowed to deal with that on the show tonight, but if we are, we certainly would like to. Uh, Frank was not privy to this, but I think he was aware of the meeting. Can you tell us something about that meeting? Well, the meeting actually came as an outgrowth of the kind of thing that I was trying to do with my book, which was to demystify uh, the industry and to personalize it. That is to say, to realize that um, we're all in this thing together. Uh, whatever roles we're playing in this particular drama, uh, we're all trapped in it. The camp is trapped in it, the law enforcement folks are, the growers are, the town business folks are. Um, and it seems, because it seems to be out of control, if together we want to bring it into control, we're going to have to start talking to each other. And we're going to have to start talking to each other in a way where we're actually listening. And instead of simply spewing forth the party line, uh, we're going to have to talk person to person. And the reason this was a private meeting rather than public meeting is we had several people there who had official government positions and official positions within their respective organizations, some of whom were 
suing others in the organizations, and mm -hmm. if you start right out with these people, the press flashing on them, they're going to have to talk the party line from the get-go. Was the meeting a success from that standpoint? Oh, no. uh, oh, yeah. we, what we did was we came upon the, the points that we can agree upon. If we are always uh, butting heads trying to uh, argue the points we don't disagree on, we're not going to get anywhere. We have to start cooperating and treating each other like human beings and actually try and forge a new way of thinking. And, and it, it's not just the marijuana issue, it's, it's many issues that our country has to uh, come across with a new way of thinking. And for most people that's scary because uh, they, they don't want to change. It's the problem. Well, I'm not sure that people don't want to change. I think they have difficulty doing it when they don't know who their enemy is or what yeah. their enemy is. Well, that's what this, this is in a sense. You could call it a meet your enemy or whatever, but uh, it's the first time that uh, several of the folks have gotten a chance to sit down face to face and meeting people who they might have seen at the other side of, <clears throat> in the other side of the courtroom. And what happened was, pe there was we, we met for four hours and there was a lot of listening going on, an awful lot of listening. Generally, when these people meet, there's very little listening. There's a lot of, uh, when some person's talking, you're just writing your notes about how you're going to counter them. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was genuinely, genuine listening. We actually came up with a few statements towards the end where we all agreed on certain things that we wanted, and we're going to work more on that. We're going to go home and do some homework and send in things and uh, see if there are other things that we can all get together on. And from this, we hope uh, to start a whole network going out, if, if they can see that these people who have been adversaries in the courtroom are starting to agree on certain aspects of, uh, of marijuana and the uh, cultural phenomenon and the dangers uh, of, of, uh, that have come to the local community by the exaggeration of this phenomenon, <clears throat> if we can agree on some of these things, and uh, then it, it's going to start to be public. And more and more people can be brought into this process, and that soon it will be open, promising. and hopefully we'll be able to say these things uh, openly with the cameras flashing before us. Well, we are in a sense doing that right now. That's I right. know uh, Frank has told me uh, earlier that uh, he would be perfectly willing to go along with any process of agreement and change that, that could make things right for everyone. And of course that also includes the obligation to obey whatever comes down. Th this is a good start. This sort of uh, this sort of form is a good start and it's easy it's a little easier for us uh, folks who are say uh, teachers or authors or landowners or whatever, but we do not ha are not representing an organization which is then going to get furious because we said the wrong thing, or we're going to lose our jobs if we're employed by camp But or some of those are. The legislators, for instance, are representing an organization who's going to get that's mad right. at the... Uh, that's right. So it, when it gets thing. to this point, uh, uh, it's our feeling, however, that there is, there is more that there's more common ground on this issue than most people realize. Well, I think that's a fact. Right. And the rumor was that this meeting was going to involve some discussion about the legalization of marijuana. Was that part of it or not? Um, well, I think really what's happened with the idea of legalization is realistically, this year or next year or in the next couple, few years, it's not going to happen. I mean, uh, it's, you, you can take polls or not take polls, but you look at the, the political climate in the country and it might happen in, the, in, the, in a few years hence, but it's not on the immediate horizon. And we look, we, we, we look at that, we also look at the idea that uh, uh, in the eradication is not on the immediate horizon. Here again, uh, uh, there might be steps taken towards it, but it's not going to be complete. So we're, we're kind of condemned to a sort of never-never land of gray area where year after year, as harvest season comes, we're going to be at each other's throats. Right. I'd like to thank you all for being here this evening. I'll be back to thank you individually in a minute. We're going to take a commercial break right now, and then we will be right back. So thank you. Stay with us, folks. about the campaign against marijuana production, otherwise known as CAMP? It's very easy to spot marijuana, not only from 500 feet, but you can spot it from 1,000 feet. So there's really no need to fly below 500 feet to spot marijuana. I don't see that as a problem. CAMP's mission is to eradicate the commercial cultivation of marijuana in Northern California. Nothing more than that. Nothing more than that. 
and and the reasons for the need to eradicate its cultivation are not the reasons behind that are just simply the illegality of the of the uh, use of marijuana. The violence and all the other uh, crimes related to the cultivation of marijuana. Anyhow, I've got to go. Thank you. Today's farmer is not only interested in higher yields, but also in mobility. I've tried them all, and that's why I use California potting bags. When my California tomatoes are ripe and the heat's on, I need security and I get this security from California potting bags. When you can't afford to have your California tomatoes stuck in the ground, use California potting bags. I think you'll like them. They come in a few different sizes. Gotta run now. Good luck. See you in Hawaii. Introducing our new line of designer camouflage fatigues for the person on the move with a reason to hide. Made of the finest synthetic leaves and branches. Blends in with almost any vegetation. Huge art on fatigues leaves them wondering if you're really there. Available at your local nursery. guests I want to put in a couple of plugs for everybody. One is for the book Cash Crop which was written by uh, Ray Raphael here and is an historical perspective of the marijuana growing phenomena. Uh, these are copies of the magazine Since Amelia Tips which uh, can tell you something about the growing of marijuana and here's something if you can find it which is an also a very good source book. It's a copy of the Ridge Review uh, dealing with the whole marijuana situation and I understand that Frank Creasy has been invited to write a column for the Advocate News so you can read his writing also. <coughs> At this point in the show gentlemen I'd like to uh, have all of you make a brief summation for us so that uh, we, you can have an opportunity to, to respond to one another. Uh, we'll start with Frank here because Frank's indicated he had a couple of things he wanted to, to bring up. So uh, Frank if you could start for us. Thank you Bob. Well, first thing I want to state is that I have sensed in the statements of my two uh, companion guests here that um, you cannot achieve eradication. Uh, now, I concede that you cannot achieve total eradication, but you can achieve eradication to a degree that is economically unfeasible to continue growing. And I would like to bring you up to date very briefly on what's happened this year in the second full year of the camp operation. In Mendocino County, there have been eight properties posted for confiscation for growing pot. And one of those grew only 37 plants. And yet that person stands to lose his property if that law is held to be legal. What the um, camp teams are seeing now is gardens that have been destroyed by the owners. They, they didn't wait for the camp to get there. They took them out. They've also seen mature plants thrown into the garbage dumps, hauled in there and thrown over the edge for people who just felt that it wasn't worthwhile. Uh, the camp raid teams are finding fewer gardens than last year, smaller gardens, and the consensus of opinion is that the big growers, the ones that 
really put out a large number of plants are leaving the state. They're going elsewhere. They're going to Arkansas or some other state where the heat is not so great. Now that shows me that at least as far as California is concerned, eradication is succeeding. Now I would like to point out a recent action of the state legislature a few days ago wherein the Senate approved and sent a bill to the governor for signature which provides an additional three million dollars to go into the Emerald Triangle for eradication purposes. And I would like to point out that that bill originally was introduced by Senator Barry Keane and it was for a much lesser amount, about half that, was amended in the uh, legislature to uh, right at $3 million by our own representative here, Dan Hauser. So our own state senator and our own representative in the legislature uh, uh, have, have both supported this. And it's certain to be signed by the governor. And what, it, what that means then is that Shea will be able to put the third camp team in the field next year. And then you're going to see a 50% increase in the level of, of eradication next year over what it is now. Now at the present time, camp is one-third ahead of, of the total of last year. In other words, when the program is finished and you take the 150,000 plants they got last year, they're already one-third above that and still going strong and finding lots of it to eradicate. Do you know what percentage of the total crop that represents? Uh, they estimated last time they got 20% of it. Now that's a very small percentage really, and 80% is not a bad risk. If you can plant 100 plants and, and harvest 80, that's not bad. This time it's going to go down to 60 or less than that. And next year I think you're going to get to the breakover point where it isn't worthwhile anymore. Now. Um, I'm not even going to discuss, because we don't have time, the, the many evils, as I perceive it, of raising pot and drug trafficking in general, and the way one thing leads to another, and the effect it has on our children, and, and the effect it has on the communities, all these are bad things. But we don't have time to go into that now. I could talk for an hour all by myself on that. But I do want to touch on one final point, and this relates to Tom's magazine, Sensing Me a Tips. Now I read this the other night, and I perceive this as a very complete technical publication. It starts with preparing the soil and the selection of seeds, and it goes all the way through the propagation, inside and out, transplanting, the raising to maturity, the sexing of it, the, the harvesting, the drying, the marketing, and what to do with your money after you get it so you don't get caught. <laughs> all right. To my way of thinking, there is a very definite moral aspect to this because this Sensimia Tips magazine is available on the newsstand to any high school kid that wants to pick it up and pay $4 for it. And I think what you've got here is a magazine that is so complete and so informative that he would then be able, with no prior experience, to start growing marijuana and probably bring a crop to fruition. And to my way of thinking, that is at least contributing to the delinquency of a minor, and I figure that the moral aspect of this is just enormous. I, I would never want to see my name in any article in here or have anything to do with such a publication. And I would, I would say, take them to jail. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it would come to that before it's over. Now, I think that sums it up, and I think Tom uh, deserves a chance to respond because I got a real bad uh, reaction to this magazine, and I want to say it, be on up, up front with it. Well, I, both this, of you look like you're popping, but Tom looks like he's popping more. I think so Tom has prior yeah. interest, uh, <laughs> having been attacked more personally. This, this is typical of where our country's going. We have supposedly patriotic Americans that wave the flag and sometimes hide behind the flag, giving us rhetorical lip service how they support the Constitution. But here we have an example saying, my magazine uh, is evil, and I, I imagine, would you agree that my magazine should be banned? Not in the sense that you offer opinion. Now you have letters to the editor there, and you have articles which are not technical know-how uh, type of things. 
Now, in the sense that this is a technical publication, which explains exactly how to do it and where to get the supplies that you need, I consider this an accessory to the trade and it should be banned. Well, th this just goes to show where our country is going. And I feel the true Americans of the majority of the country are going to uh, put down this attempt to scuttle the Constitution. And, and we are the true Americans. I mean, it's going to come down to, do you support the Constitution or don't you? And th it's a greater question than marijuana. It's civil liberties, civil rights, and in many cases, uh, uh, the, the right of privacy and freedom to do as you please in your home. The thing that he doesn't understand is uh, the outdoor grower is like a dinosaur. People do not grow outdoors anymore. They grow in the inner cities primarily uh, in many areas of the country. So we are looking at a situation that it's going to be uh, very hard for the police to eradicate outdoors and it's totally impossible to do it indoors. And it's time to sit down and negotiate and certain members of the government realize that fact and are starting to do that. And I think more and more of the government will start to sit down and negotiate. They negotiate in most every other war we've been in, and it's time to negotiate now. We could get into a lot of nitty gritty specific issues, which we really don't have time to do, but suffice it to say that on either side, you have extremes that go from radically militaristic to, to a, a moderate somewhere near the middle position and of course each side wishes to capture that moderate view. I'd like to go to Ray at this point because he has taken the position of moderator both at the forum recently and in his book Cash Crop and uh, ask him in terms of your dealing with all of these attitudes which you have over and over again, uh, what can you tell us at this point that would be something of a summation, something of an indication where the future might lie or what's going to happen to marijuana, what's going to happen to civil issues, what's going to happen to the philosophy and can you do it in 20 seconds? I am, <laughs> <laughs> I am very suspicious of those who come with, uh, with uh, projections of where we will all be in 10 years and I have hard and fast evidence in black and white for my system. Mary Jane, why did you leave me? Where did you go when the summer came? I miss you so. You know that it grieves me. I haven't been high in such a long, long time. It didn't rain this morning, and it didn't rain all week. Hasn't rained in such a long, long time I know we're gonna have a dry street Oh, Mary Jane Why did you leave me? Where did you go when the summer came? I miss you so You know that it grieves me I haven't been high in such a long, long time well, I know that I got a woman And she's always on my side She comforts me when I need her She takes me for a ride When I think about her And I remember what was good I know I could live without her But I don't believe a word Oh Mary Jane Why did you leave me? Where did you go when the summer came? I miss you so know that it grieves me I haven't been high in such a long, long time No, I, I haven't been high
It's such a long, long time. Mr. Charlie Reamer.